What a wonderful reminder. Jesus, our great high priest who pardons our sin. Jesus, our sinless saviour who made an end to sin. Jesus, our perfect, spotless righteousness and the king of glory and of grace. We're going to have some announcements and then we'll come back up. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Um, COVID update, um, the government have released some new rules so that now you could have carols outside and as long as there are allocated seats for people at carols, you could have a 1.5 metre distance. If there are unallocated seats, it's a 4 metre distance and you've still got to keep your record of who's come to the carols. Um, it's, it's a little too late and too much for us to organise. So we've just got Christmas Day, 9 o'clock. That's our Christmas celebration. Um, the, the thing about the carols that's a development is that people will be allowed to sing at carols as long as they're wearing a mask. <laughs> if you're under 11, or so under 12, you don't have to wear a mask to sing. Okay. If that applies... To anyone, you can sing at the carols. There you go. <laughs> uh, but the development is that we hope the Archbishop will be able to persuade the New South Wales Health Department that we can sing in church wearing a mask. At the moment, we're not even allowed to do that. But we're, that's the next development we're looking for and hoping. So we're learning to live with COVID, which means constant change and constant awareness and thankfulness that we have had 14 days of no new COVID cases in New South Wales. So very grateful for that as we continue to pray uh, for the rest of the world going through much more difficult times. Um, yeah. Daryl. Most people should, could, should have received an email in the last, uh, yesterday, day before, uh, from uh, the wardens. We've got uh, a couple of very important things happening next Sunday. Um, one is that it's the final day for Chris and Judy as the official rector of the church. And also we'll be uh, having a celebration for the time that Jeremy and Felicity have been with us. So it's been organised for us to have a lunch in our, on our grounds outside, commencing at 11.30, um, so that we can uh, pay tribute to the, uh, the contribution and the teaching that has come from both uh, Chris and from Jeremy. So with that, there's a few special things. It's a BYO. We're not going to provide things uh, at all. We will have chairs and picnic tables available for those, if, but if you do have some chairs and picnic tables, it would be good to bring them. 
Uh, we have no idea what the numbers are going to be like. Um, hopefully it might be a big crowd, but not too many. We're only limited to 300. <laughs> There is, uh, there is a basket, little brown basket at the back there for people who wish to make a donation to the cost of uh, us providing a gift to Chris and Judy and to Jeremy and Felicity. Uh, if, if you don't want to do it that way, you can do it through the church uh, direct crediting system. Um, we are aiming, to, well, it will be a COVID safe environment. We're taking those precautions. We will be providing the tea and coffee facility via the stables, um, much the same as what Margaret White did last week or the week before with yeah, whatever it was, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, people won't be able to go in there, it'll have to be done, you know, people have to be handed out. So if you can bring your cup for that, it would, uh, would be very useful. So remember that, it's, um, it is a time to, to uh, be a thank you celebration uh, for a wonderful five. Five years? 2015 January we came. I wasn't here. <laughs> and Jeremy's been with us uh, almost two years. Jeremy will be staying on till the 20th of December, so we'll still see his face around, but we thought let's do one big celebration together. Um, it's enough to organise one celebration, let alone two. So that's where it is. Remember 11.30 next Sunday. Uh, we'd be very pleased to see as many of you here as is possible. If you've got any issues, just let us know, but I think it, it should work out. We've, we've organised where we think everyone can sit to make it uh, COVID safe. We may have to move cars into the reserve, that's all, just to give us that flat area to sit on. Thank you. Well, today we're going to continue in our series in Galatians. Um, in Galatians, Paul has been reiterating to, his, to the church the truth that we are not justified through works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And it is through this faith and by the Holy Spirit that we get to be heirs of the promise and be sons of God. Um, let me read from Galatians 4, 4 and 5, what we'll be hearing from later. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. The law reminds us that we are sinful and we can't completely keep the law. It's only through Jesus and his, his obedience that we can be made righteous. So we're going to hear the summary, Jesus' summary of the law, um, and then we're going to pray a prayer of confession. God calls us to live our lives to his glory. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like, like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. But we fail to honour him as we ought and to respond to his love for us, recognising our guilt and trusting in God's mercy and grace. So let us confess our sins together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbours as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbour, and to live for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Merciful Father, we rejoice that you pardon and forgive those who truly repent and trust in your Son. Deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite Felicity to come up and continue in prayers for us.
Let's continue praying. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can now come before you in prayer, knowing that you hear our prayers. Thank you that through Jesus' death and resurrection, and by the Holy Spirit in us, we can call you Abba, Father. But Father, we do acknowledge that we are still weak and still fail to obey you at all times. We are sorry that we have followed our own ways and the desires of our own hearts. Father, please forgive us and change us so that we may truly seek your will in our lives and live a godly and obedient life. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for the ongoing work of Anglicare who support many people who are struggling with the impact of COVID, especially uh, in yeah, their financial situation and in relationships. Father, we pray that the work of the Toys and Tucker program, through which so many people experience the love um, of other Christians, will um, be of much joy and comfort to families this time of year. Um, and we continue to pray for our state and federal governments and their health advisors as they consider further easing restrictions, especially in the lead up to Christmas. We pray that you would continue to show mercy on the COVID situation in New South Wales and Australia, so that regulations during Christmas would allow for churches to invite many more people to attend Christmas services and be reminded of our Lord and Saviour coming into this world. <coughs> We pray for those of us in our congregations who are sick or suffering or otherwise in need. Father, please bring healing in your good timing. Father, we ask yeah, that in your timing it might be your will to bring healing and comfort. But above all, we ask that you would be upholding these people. Through their trials, please be at work to grow them in Christ's likeness and in their conviction of your goodness and sovereignty, so that through their suffering, the tested genuineness of their faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And Heavenly Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you that it is living and active and pierces the hardest of hearts. Thank you that it teaches us all we need to know to make us wise for salvation. We also thank you for our sermon series in Galatians. Thank you that in your perfect timing, you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, into this world to redeem the world from slavery to sin. Thank you that through Christ's work, we can be declared righteous and be made co-heirs with him. We pray that as we come to hear from your word and as we share in the Lord's Supper, please open our hearts and our minds to understand and rejoice of your saving work through Christ. Please put aside any distractions we may have and pour into our hearts such love toward you that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Amen. Amen. And join with me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks, Felicity. Um, please open up your Bibles, and I'll invite David and Don to come up for our Bible readings. Thanks, David. The Old Testament reading is uh, from Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, and the heading is A Time for Everything. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. 
a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament the New Testament reading comes from Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 to 8. So Paul continues on speaking about the heir being Jesus. I mean that the heir as long as he is a child is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir from God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd give us wisdom and insight to understand your word the will to put into practice and the desire to glorify you in all things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're getting close to Christmas. I'm sure you're glad to know that. You might not have otherwise known, but it's getting closer all the time. You have to think about the presents to buy for people. And it would be really good if you knew someone really well and could spot a need they had and be able to supply that need for the modest amount that you were willing to spend on that person and buy an appropriate gift. The trouble is that we live in such an affluent society that people have got just about everything they need. What do you give to someone who's got everything they need? It's another box of chocolates. Ginger chocolates are often popular with some people. You've got to think something they can consume that would be useful I keep thinking of the ad, don't wait to be told you need palm olive gold, you know. And sometimes if you give someone a gift, it's a bit of a hint. You think, oh, why are you giving me this, you know? I think I need this. We think of little boys looking for how to get their first bike and that sort of thing, an appropriate gift. And sometimes it's hard, so we, we sort of lapse into giving gift cards here. Spend 50 bucks at Bunnings. <laughs> Uh, or go to your makeup shop and get what you need. You know, we think of an appropriate gift. It, you want to give something personal, something that's appropriate. When God the Father sent his son into the world, it's the best gift we could ever get because it's the gift everybody needs. It's the gift of his son. Um, so we're looking at Galatians chapter 4. We're continuing uh, in the series this series where Paul is writing against false teachers. It doesn't come out of the blue. He's writing against people who think they can earn their way to heaven or earn merit with God 
and he's saying, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. So I've got three points I want to look at in this passage. When did God do it? Why did God do it? And how did God do it? Okay. Just when, why, and how. As we read Galatians, we see that Paul's argument is based on the idea that God gets his timing right. That's an argument. It's an argument you need to make that God is in control and God knows what he's doing and God gets his timing right. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic is devastating throughout the world. Can you imagine someone saying, this pandemic could not have come at a worse time? Behind that statement is, well, when would have been a good time? <laughs> when would have been a good time for a COVID pandemic? I mean, really? But it goes back to the question, how is it possible that God should allow that French group of scientists who'd been allowed to operate an experimental unit in Yuan in China, how did God allow them to develop the COVID-19 uh, disease, coronavirus, and let it out of the unit and spread throughout the world? If God is in control, how did this happen? We believe in God's timing, in God's allowing, in God's enabling his people to manage whatever he allows to happen to them. It's a difficult concept. Is there ever a good time for any disaster? Is there ever a good time for sickness? Is there ever a good time for family conflicts? Is there ever a good time for a marriage breakup? Is there ever a good time for a car accident? But under God, we believe God is in control of everything that happens to us and will give us the energy, the understanding, the patience to manage. We believe that God works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And what is his purpose? Romans 8.29, that we should be conformed to the image of his son. This is one of the big, big differences between the atheist who believes in evolution and no purpose and life's an accident and the Christian who believes that God is in control and life has a purpose. And the purpose is for us to become more like Jesus and be part of the new heavens and the new earth in fellowship, being glorified with God forever. It's the big picture and the questions of suffering and the questions of blessing force us to the big picture. And the big picture says... There's a time for everything. Ecclesiastes. Everything there, for everything there is a season. We go through seasons in life. There's the normal seasons. There's the extraordinary events. And there's the big picture. And here in Galatians 4 we have the big picture. But the big picture's been on view right from the start of Galatians. If you have your Bible you could look at Galatians chapter 1 verses 3 to 5. Where Paul begins by saying, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. That's the big picture. That was according to the will of our God and Father. To him be glory forever and ever. From God's point of view, this is the present evil age. It will end when Jesus returns, but at the moment God allows it to continue in order that more people might come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now's the time for salvation. Now's the time for conversion. Now's the time for gospel proclamation. Now's the time for missionaries to keep going out into the world. I read one of the missionary uh, letters yesterday from France. Even with COVID-19, the farmers in France are still ploughing their fields, putting the seed in, getting the harvest going. It cannot stop food production. Their conclusion was we cannot stop sowing the seed of the gospel, even in COVID-19. It's a task that needs to keep going. God decided to act and send his son according to the will of God, our God and Father. In chapters 2 and 3, Paul's arguing the law held us in bondage. It taught us that we were in trouble and we needed a solution, a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The laws gave God people Israel, were meant to show them how to live because they were God's people and they were meant to show they needed help to live as God's people. But they needed to realise that law keeping was not the solution. Galatians 3 verse 10. All who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For as written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Unless we keep the law perfectly, there's no way we can earn our way to heaven. We can't do it. Paul takes him right back to the promise to Abraham that we looked at last week. The promise made to Abraham was that his seed or his offspring would come and bring blessing to all the nations and that seed is the Lord Jesus. Verse 13 and 14 of chapter 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Deuteronomy, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit by faith. The law makes us aware we need a saviour because we're failures. Everyone is a sinner in need of a saviour. And that law, verses 23 to 29, keeps us captive, imprisoned, like a guardian or a disciplinarian who keeps reminding you that you've done the wrong thing and you need a solution, a better way forward. But in Christ Jesus, verse 26, you're all sons of God through faith. So Paul is writing to people who've become Christians, put their faith in Jesus, but the Jewish people, the circumcision party, the law-keeping party, have come to the Gentiles in Galatia and said, it's very good that you've come to faith in Jesus Christ. You only need one thing more, faith in Jesus plus the law. Faith in Jesus plus good works, grace plus good works, it will give you confidence in your salvation. And then you'll know that you're in God's family Therefore, get circumcised and keep all the law. That was the pressure they were putting on them. And Paul's saying the promise to Abraham came before the law, before the instruction for circumcision. It's by grace you are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And he takes up this whole idea of being an heir, someone who will receive the inheritance. It's guaranteed. So Paul's drawing a parallel between members of family who are growing up but haven't yet reached their maturity. And I was meant to bring up the 21st key. And I forgot it's on my desk right there on the left. The 21st key is a sign of maturity. Well, it was in the old days. It was uh, engraved by my dad and given to my mum. Uh, it's very nice. But you get the key. You'd have a 21st birthday party, wouldn't you, to show you you're now grown up, big person. And uh, it's, it's part of maturity. And Paul's saying that until you reach your maturity, you're under a guardian, you're under a disciplinarian. Um, it's like people writing their will and saying, yes, you can have the money after I die, but you have to get to the age of 30. I want to make sure you're really mature, otherwise you're going to waste the money. And Paul's saying that's been that waiting period, that growing up period. Until Christ comes, everyone is subject to the power of Satan. See, verse 3 talks about you, when we were children, were enslaved to the elemental principles of the world. Uh, in verse 8, he talks about serving those that are not gods. Uh, and from the Christian perspective, you're either in Christ or you're serving Satan. I don't know if we can see it that clearly. It's not a modern view. And anybody who espoused it would be asked to leave the university or the, the high school if they were teaching, if they said that sort of thing. But it's what the Bible's saying. But when the fullness of time came, at the right time, when the people have been taught about the law, they need the promise to be fulfilled in Abraham, when the fullness of time came, when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman and born under the law. What moment is the right time, the fullness of time, when the time had fully come? It's a, it's a question that many people have pondered. Why did Jesus come just then? 
And if you look at the historical and geographical circumstances of the time, uh, there was always this saying, all roads lead to Rome. That's because the Roman garrisons needed to march out pretty quickly and quell any rebellion and independence movements. They built the Roman roads for that. But you could say that the Roman roads also served the spread of the gospel. Um, they were pretty rough and rugged roads. You haven't got smooth tar, remember? You've got all these cobblestones. You actually, it's hard to walk on them, these Roman roads. There's some still there beside the, the big, big highways now. But the spread of the gospel was much easier. The spread of the gospel was much easier because of the Greek influence, Alexander the Great, some centuries before, but had meant that Greek was the common language in many parts of the world at that time. Um, these are true, but you could also say, well, maybe Christ should have waited till the internet, and then we would have had a quicker spread of the gospel. More people would have heard more easily. In the fullness of time is really when God decided, I think, Everything was in preparation well before. The prophecies about the Christ coming, the suffering servant and so on in Isaiah, uh, the various prophets proclaiming the message, uh, things were in place. But they'd been in place for 300 years. <laughs> it was a long time to wait if you were in a hurry. But in God's perfect timing, when he was ready, the perfect timing is Christ came. That's the perfect timing. The event makes it the perfect timing. Uh, Christ came when God decided, and by the grace of God, it was the greatest thing that ever happened in the history of the world, which is why we have uh, BC before Christ and AD and O Domini in the year of our Lord. We mark the significance of Christ coming into the world. Secondly, why did God do it? He did it when it was the right time in his point, point of view. He did it because of his initiative. God did it because he cares for the world. God so loved the world that he sent, he gave his only son. So that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God did it so that people would know they could have a relationship with him in this life and in the world to come. God sent forth his son of his own free will, out of his outgoing love. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came into the world to save sinners because we needed a saviour. It was predicted in God's perfect timing. Uh, at Christmas time, in many places, they'll be reading the Bible from Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Jesus is God's gift to us, which we celebrate, which Christians celebrate at Christmas time. God sent forth his son. He thoughtfully, carefully planned to give his son to the people of the world. He is God's son. He is God the Son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's not just another prophet, not just another king, not another priest. He is man and God. He is divine and human. He is unique which makes the Christian faith unique. They're not all the same, trying to make good people better. Christianity is unique. We celebrate the birth of God. He came into the world. The word was with God and the word became flesh. Jesus is God with skin on. It's because of God's love that Jesus comes into the world and because of the love of Jesus that he gave himself for our sins in the world. The third question is, how did he do it? How does the coming of Jesus bring about the salvation of people? Well, Paul really uh, picks it up in these little phrases saying that Jesus was born of a woman. He was truly human, uh, of the spirit of Mary. He entered fully into our humanity. He grew up and had to learn to walk and talk like one of us. He was tempted in every way as we are, and yet without sinning. We read about his temptations in Matthew chapter 4, where the devil came and tempted him, even quoting the Bible at times. He was born of a woman. But then in Matthew 5, Jesus says that all the law needed to be fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17. 
Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly, I say to you, on heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until it's all accomplished. And Jesus is saying, their righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees, and we have that righteousness in Jesus' righteousness. It's imputed or given to us. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He came, you see, to redeem those who are under the law, to buy us out of slavery. He paid the price that we couldn't pay because we were slaves to sin and destined for hell. And Jesus redeems us. He buys us back by his unblemished sacrifice on the cross. He pays the price for your freedom and mine when he dies on that cross at Calvary. When we think of Christmas, we need to remember that the, the shadow of the cross is over the crib. He came to die. He came to die for us. He came to rescue us from sin and death and separation from God. Remember, Paul's been emphasising that in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. And as a result of what Christ has done, for all who put their faith in him through the work of the Holy Spirit, there is this identity. We're adopted into God's family. We become the true children of God, not just the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. We are the children of God. He's brought us into his family by his will. Remember those famous words are often repeated at Christmas time. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God's initiative, God's completion, our glory. And as a result, we can call God Father. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, calling Abba, Father. I think that most of us could pray more often than we do. You think, you know, they say there's no atheist in foxholes um, sometimes say you know, would you like a minister to visit your dying father it's not that bad and so you only get to prayer when you're on the edge when do we pray what motivates our prayer how disciplined are we how much of a privilege is it to call God our, our father I know at Christmas time it would be very special for people to be with family Every day for the Christian is special to be with our Heavenly Father in quiet, devoted prayer, giving thanks, expressing our requests, calling upon our Abba, Father, our, this is our daddy, this is a daddy word, this is close and personal. Again, this is one of the things that means so much to me as a Christian, in, as opposed to all the other religions. Our God is personal. Our relationship with God is personal. Let us make man know our own image means God is a person and we are people who are able to relate in conversation and even when we don't know what words to say, the Holy Spirit helps us from Romans 8. This eyes too deep for expression. God the Father sends God the Son into the world and God the Father and God the Son sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts that we might know God as our Heavenly Father. What a shame it is to have a very caring and loving Father to whom you never speak. May it not be so with us. The Spirit helps us to pray. The Spirit helps us to live. The Spirit helps us to cope with the changes and chances of this fleeting world. In one sense, 
Uh, one of the sadnesses uh, that I have as I think about retiring is that I won't get to preach on Galatians 5, 22 and 23. <laughs> There's so many wonderful things in the book of Galatians. Um, but the, Because God has sent his spirit into our hearts that we might call him Abba Father, we have the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And they're the things that I think the Spirit draws on and draws up in us even more in the midst of the difficulties of life. Character develops through difficulties when we turn to God and trust him more. We need to believe, especially from this verse, that Christ came in the fullness of time at the right time because God's in control of the world. And God's in control of our lives and the timing of the events in our world. The blessings we have, let's give him thanks. And the difficulties we face, let's trust him to see us through. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our Father. We pray that you'd help us to pray more and draw upon our relationship with you more. We pray that you'd help us to be thankful for all your blessings to us and dependent upon you for all the struggles we face. In Jesus' name, amen. As you came in, I hope that you received a little cup with some bread on top and some black currant juice underneath. You might like to... Make sure you know where that is and know how to take off the little bit of clear plastic on top to get to the bread and then take off the silver to get to the, to get to the um, juice. Okay, so we're sharing the Lord's Supper. Have we restarted? Excellent, thank you. At the heart of the Christian life, is an active trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death for sin. We've covered that in our song, we've covered that in our confession, we've covered that in the sermon. The Lord's Supper that we're about to share is a symbolic meal, originating in Jesus' last supper with his disciples. We express and strengthen our trust in him as we eat and drink as brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord's Supper is an outward sign, it's a visible sign of the grace shown to us in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're invited to feed on him spiritually as we think about his death for us. He shed his blood, he gave his body. So I invite you to pray this prayer of humble access with me. Merciful Lord, we come to your table, trusting not in our goodness, but in your measureless grace. Even though we are not worthy to eat from the crumbs under your table, you are always rich in mercy. Gracious Lord, enable us by faith in Jesus Christ to grow spiritually as we eat this bread and drink this wine, so that we may be cleansed and forever dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross offered once and for all time the one true sacrifice for sin and reconciling us to you and satisfying your just demands. By rising to new life, Jesus has secured eternal deliverance for his people. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. We thank you, Father, that on the night that Jesus died, he took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We say together, Therefore, Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine, and pray that we who eat and drink them, believing our Saviour's word, may spiritually share his body and blood 
Amen. We eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord. We do this until he returns. Taken the silver bit off the top, got the bread. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Give people time. It's hard to peel it off without spilling it. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. We pray together. Father, thank you for feeding us who have received these your gifts of bread and wine with the spiritual food of the body and blood of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you for assuring us of your goodness and love and that we are members of his body. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My well, friends, our final song is Consider Christ. It's both a reflection on what Christ has done for us, his work in us by his spirit, and also a commitment. My Lord and God, you are so rich in mercy, mere words alone are not sufficient thanks. So take my life, transform, renew and change me, that I might be a living sacrifice. Let's stand. Consider Christ, the source of our salvation, that he should take the penalty for me. Though he was pure, the lamb without a blemish he took my sins and nailed them to the tree my lord and god you
Let's share in the grace. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.